On this edition of Independent Sources, the high cost of citizenship. What's behind the growing number of immigrants who cannot afford naturalization to the U.S.? Health care. Hospital closures in the five boroughs raise concerns that the city may be on the verge of a primary health care crisis. And Bushwick barbers, Latino entrepreneurs, a buzz about the big business of cutting hair in that neighborhood. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Diana Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The cost of becoming a U.S. citizen is at an all time high right now. Green card applicants pay $680 to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, as well as other fees they incur for lawyers. Those can be particularly back breaking costs and has led to a massive decrease in the number of people applying for green cards and becoming citizens. The most recent fee hike was in 2008 when over one million people became U.S. citizens. Since then, the numbers have dwindled and never returned to their previous highs. The advocacy group, the National Council of La Raza, has been working with local banks in Maryland to acquire microloans for immigrants seeking their citizenship. I spoke with Jose Garcia of La Raza and Alan Wernick of the CUNY Citizenship Now program about how immigrants are trying to navigate the high cost of American citizenship. Alan, why does it cost so much money to fill out a form to become a U.S. citizen? Well, the government's, <coughs> the, the Congress has told the uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services that the uh, uh, service aspect of their business has to be paid for by application fees. So, as you know, as as the services has, has improved and as inflation has come about, um, it's more expensive. Well, what are the consequences of that? Well, it's a big problem because a lot of people can't afford the filing fees for a lot of applications. Now, fortunately, for citizenship applications, if you're indigent or otherwise uh, can't afford the fee, um, you can get it waived. You don't have to pay the fee. But for many other applications, including the applications for the uh, young people applying for deferred action, you have to pay the fee or you can't get the benefit. Well, say out in, uh, with La Raza, you have this ingenious uh, program that you working with, where you working with banks in Maryland, trying to get micro loans uh, for immigrants who want to become citizens or can afford it. Give us the details of, of this program. Look, I mean, we're very excited about this program. We know that the fee is close to six hundred and eighty thousand, uh, eighty, eighty hundred dollars, <laughs> and this could be really hard for Latino families and other families to actually to get their citizenship. And we understand not only because it's an economic barrier, but we also understand that this is could be we can leverage this also to get them inside the financial mainstream market. So what we have done is work with Casa Maryland, uh, with the American uh, New American Loan Fund, and actually work to provide these small folks small lending with six payments. Of course, they have there's an underwriting that goes through Casa Maryland that they have to apply and they have to be willing. But if when they're inside the program and they prove they can they can pay for it, they have somebody and a, camp, a companionship, right? Through the process, not only in terms of the process of paying the loan, but also through the process of naturalization of this. Well, what, um, are and have, what are the fees? What's the fees uh, for, for this loan? Uh, there's no interest rate. There's a, around 14 to 16 percent. Um, it's much better than a payday loan. The payday loan could be close to 36 percent in certain areas and much, much higher. So we understand that it's, you know, for some people it might still be high, but we understand also in terms of the business, there's still some risk. This is, this is a very um, new product. And I just want to add very quickly that all the information go to the credit bureau and all these 60 participants that are go through this process, 60 of them have completed the loan, meaning that they have started to build credit that can help them in the future maybe to buy the car in with fair and sustainable rates, which is clearly important then for immigrants that are, you know, becoming American citizens. Alan, uh, CUNY has a program where it helps uh, people we cannot afford this fee. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that program? Yes, well, we, uh, CUNY has a program that provides free uh, citizenship application assistance uh, to all New Yorkers. And for individuals who cannot afford the filing fee, we have a very uh, vigorous uh, fee waiver program um, <clears throat> where we assist people in completing the fee waiver application. And uh, we've been quite successful with that. 
Also, we're working now with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs on a new citizenship program in the high schools, and we're going to be uh, uh, working with the Mayor's Office. Um, we're going to be experimenting with this uh, microloan program as well here in New York City, working with Citibank. Okay. Uh, Jose, I mean, when some people hear this form costs $600, uh, they might say, well, it's not a lot of money, but you're not factoring out the l lawyer's fees and other fees that come along. And, and, and does your program uh, take into consideration the legal fees as well as the just the application fee? Yeah, actually, there is a legal component into the program uh, also, which is, is critical. And $680, let's, let's touch on that issue, is a big issue. I mean, you're talking usually for low- and middle-income Americans, meaning that the end of their pay, uh, month, monthly payment, when this fee come up, they have to have $680. And I, I would, you know, even if you look at the wealth of a lot of low- and middle-income Americans, being Latinos or not, you know, the average is around $1,000 and so. Uh, so it, it is, you know, the, and well, you see income have decreased, cost of living have increased, wealth have been disappearing due to the housing crisis, meaning that people around your family also doesn't have the ha financial stability that they, maybe they used to have. And that's the people you used to ask for money in this type of, you know, in incredible important circumstances that's not there. Um, you know, we, of course, we love the any type of program that can waive this fee. Uh, that that will be the primary way, but in terms of you know br actually getting into a broader group of people, uh, we, we're we're working with Casa Maryland and others to to make this happen. Is there any way to uh, afford to make this broader than just Maryland? Because this this problem is certainly nationwide. Let me tell you, I mean that's something that we're being we're continually talking about. This is only a pilot program. There is a you know, I, I come to shows like yours and we talk to a lot of people. There is a lot of need and and a lot of um uh, a lot of people want to be part of this. So we are exploring ways, if it's not National Council La Raza, any other organization that what is important is that these micro loans, as you said, are sustainable and not predatory, right? Yes. Um, that that is that is something that we have to be very vigilant when we put these these products together. That, that they're fair to the peoples that they're served. That actually they have a kind of companionship. And let's think also through processes that they can people can build their credit and actually maybe get a bank account as part of it. So you know, it just we see it, we see it not only as part of getting people citizenship, but also. Into, uh, getting them in, inside the financial market. Okay. Alan, the impact has been real. For instance, since 2008, the number of uh, applicants applying for citizenship has decreased drastically. In 2008, you had a million point one. 2009, 743,000. 2010, 619, and it's been going down ever since. I mean, some cynic would say, is that the intended consequence that the... the, the I don't think that's true. In fact, it's really interesting. You know, uh, under the Obama administration, the one thing uh, that they've been strong on is increasing and improving the services that are available to immigrants. Separate report, you know, I'm not just addressing now their deportation policy, which I think is atrocious. Th that's but another, that's uh, another, that's another, another show. Yes. But, uh, but in terms of service, they really improved the services. And my sense is that uh, from a political point of view, incumbents tend to want people to become naturalized because as part of the naturalization process very patriotic you know you have the you have a videotape from the, the president video. of the united states and even ba i remember under ronald reagan you know when he when he ran for re-election there was a huge effort to help people naturalize so i think incumbents like new incumbents like new citizens to generally i think the immigration service prior to the you know the last uh, let's say four to four years uh, ha has not done a very good job of providing that service. I think the improvement uh, in the last three years has just been outstanding. Well, you know, when, when you look at uh, those fees, it's not just for people becoming citizens. I mean, INS or immigration fees are very high. When you look at Central Americans and Haitians who, who qualify for temporary protective status, these fees are about four hundred or so dollars. More I than mean, that, yes, yeah. and the fees are very high. And, and of course, if for people who are who are here, let's say you marry a U.S. citizen, uh, the fees are going to be over fifteen hundred dollars just for the uh, you know the application fees. And there's no fee waiver 
in those cases. Uh, for the Haitians applying for uh, temporary protected status, there is a fee waiver available. We'll be doing a lot of those as there's a re-registration process going on uh, now for uh, Haitians. Um, and for the deferred action, there is no fee waiver. So unfortunately, there's a very limited, for, if a person's really destitute, maybe in a homeless shelter, they can get the fee waived. But for most people, they aren't going to be able to. So people are just pulling together. Uh, they understand that they're going to get employment authorization, they're borrowing money, um, but maybe with these microloan programs, it could be expanded to other areas beyond citizenship. Well, unfortunately, we have to leave it at that. Jose Garcia, Alan Warnick, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. Still to come on independent sources, hospital closures around the city have some officials fearing a public health crisis. Before that, Marlene Peralta has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. The mostly Korean wholesale businesses along Broadway in Manhattan are being displaced by Chinese retailers that can offer cheaper prices. The Korea Times reports that only 30% of wholesale shops selling items like jewelry and wigs are Korean. The paper explains that Chinese stores are able to offer cheaper prices because they have their own factories back home. Voices of New York reports that there has been a dramatic growth of the Bhutanese community in New York. The site profiles a native from the South Asian country who arrived in New York in 1999 as a political refugee. Back then, he could hardly find other compatriots here. However, by 2009, about 23,000 Bhutanese had relocated to the U.S. They were part of the first wave of immigrants coming from Bhutan as part of the U.N. Multination Agreement relocation. Bhutan is a landlocked state located between India and China. El Diario La Prensa highlights a Jewish lawyer who's drawn the ire of the Hasidic community as he fights for the housing rights of some low-income Latinos and African-American residents of North Brooklyn. Martin Needleman's latest battle is against the housing development called Broadway Triangle. Needleman says the development is promoting racial segregation because many apartments were allocated to white families. A court also found that many units were reserved for the Hasidic Jew community. From the Amsterdam News, a recent study suggests that black and Latino students are attending increasingly racially segregated schools around the country despite the decline in residential segregation. The report released by the Civil Rights Project at UCLA says that 15 percent of black students and 14 percent of Latino students attend apartheid schools. The study finds that students face double segregation by both race and poverty. New York, Illinois, and Michigan are at the top of the list of the most segregated states for these two groups. And finally, the Jewish Forward highlights the success of the Michigan Jewish Institute. In less than 10 years, the college has expanded from a small campus to an online institution thanks in part to $25 million in federal Pell Grants designated for low-income students. As a result, enrollment has risen from 300 to 2,000, and students are now able to take classes overseas, including Israel. However, the paper notes the success has come despite the poor performance of national proficiency exams and the problem of a student retention. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic and community media. Back to Gary and Vianora. Thanks, Marlene. The number of hospitals in the city shutting their doors is growing at an alarming rate. In the last 10 years, 15 hospitals have closed and six more may face the axe in Brooklyn. The crisis has emerged because of the delicate dance between caring for the city's populace while balancing a hospital budget. This month's City Limits magazine features some in-depth reporting on the flaws in the financial and physical structure of New York City's hospitals that have led to this crisis. I sat down with Ruth Ford of City Limits magazine to get a few more details about these closures. We also talked about what's being done to address these developments that could leave even more city residents without primary health care. Ruth, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Which hospitals in Brooklyn are now on shaky ground and who are they serving? Sure. So uh, the hospitals that are on the shakiest ground are Brookdale, which is out in East New York, Interfaith, 
is on very, very shaky ground, and then Wyckoff, which is around East Williamsburg. These are the three that really um, are really at, at, a, at a crisis moment, but there are other hospitals that are also uh, on, on shaky ground, but less shaky ground. So all in all, there's six hospitals. There's Brooklyn Hospital, there's Wyckoff, there's Interfaith, there's Brooklyn Hospital. SUNY Downstate has uh, a second campus, and uh, state officials are saying that SUNY Downstate has to start to consolidate. Um, it, these are all hospitals that serve uh, predominantly um, African American, Latino American, Caribbean American communities, and these are communities with a lot, a lot of different complicated health issues and they arrive at the hospital with complicated health issues so the hospitals um, have to pay more to care for people and get fewer reimbursements so it just becomes this issue that the more people they care for they're actually getting fewer dollars back so it's almost impossible now especially for Wyckoff and, Brook and Brookdale out in East New York and Interfaith to stay open. Kingsbrook Jewish is also on shaky ground, but it is doing better. It is doing better than the other hospitals. How many t hospitals in total are there in Brooklyn? There's 15. There's 15. 15. And six are in trouble, and three of the six really are in, are in a very bad way. And they're in communities where people primarily use the hospital for primary care, where they don't access or can't access uh, doctor's offices or health care clinics. So they really, really rely on their local hospital. So should these hospitals close, people will be pushed to the next hospital system, public or private. So that will become overcrowded. So the domino effect starts to happen. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that's complicated. There's a lot of factors, but it really comes down to the fact that people in Brooklyn are sick and the hospitals are not getting the money they need from the feds and the state to take care of them. Is there uh, a big percentage of people taking uh, um, their needs for health care to Manhattan yeah. rather than staying in Brooklyn? Is, yeah. is that a main cause to why the hospitals That's, are it, doing bad? It, an enormous number. 35% of Brooklyn residents with private health care, you know, Aetna, Oxford, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, are going to Manhattan. They're leaving the borough. Most of them are going to Manhattan for care. So if you're losing 35% of your potential patients with private insurers who pay more in reimbursements many times than the federal government or the state, you're 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 losing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, it's just a staggering amount of money. I mean, not for the 35%, I should say tens of millions, but it's just a staggering amount of money for a borough to lose and for the hospital system to lose. They can't make that money up. Why do folks prefer to go to Manhattan? The perception is that hospitals in Manhattan are better and that the care is better and that they get, and the hospitals in Manhattan, many of them get higher rankings. Now, there's arguments about the quality of care in Manhattan hospitals, uh, but the overall perception is that if you have the money, you would go to Manhattan for your care. Now, this is not a new problem. This is not due to the economic crisis that has hit us uh, a few years back. Well, this has been going on in New York City for at least a decade. Uh, why is New York doing so badly uh, with, with uh, its hospitals when the rest of the country is managing to, to staying afloat in, in many other places in the country? Well, across the country the way hospitals are staying afloat is that they're merging and they're consolidating and in New York City there are mergers going on um, Lenox Hill merged with Manhattan Eye and Ear uh, Continuum is in talks now to possibly merge with Mount Sinai I mean the bigger hospitals see this as an opportunity to sort of create economies of scale where they can merge with another large hospital and save on costs, labor costs or supplies and things like that. But what's happening in New York City, what's particular to New York City, is that New York City has such a high percentage of people on Medicaid. It has such a high percent of people in poverty. So New York City hospitals rely heavily, heavily, heavily on the federal government and on the state government to help them carry the costs of caring for Medicaid, Medicare, and poor patients. And 
while that also goes on in Los Angeles and other large cities in, in New York, I think in, in Brooklyn alone, I think the numbers that, you know, 40% of people are on Medicaid, you know, one in four is, uh, patients is living in poverty. I mean, the numbers are pretty staggering, and the federal government has been cutting its reimbursement rates year after year. So it's just, it's really hitting uh, a crisis point, but mostly because New York has so many folks who are on Medicaid or who are just living in poverty. You've touched upon um, who's being affected. Can you elaborate on that and give us a sense of what will people do in, in these neighborhoods where hospitals may disappear? I mean, that's, that's, you know, the heart of the issue. What will people do if the hospitals close? What will people do in Brooklyn, in East New York, in Crown Heights, in New Lots, in Wingate, um, in Ocean Hill, Brownsville? What will people do if these major hospital systems shut down? Because when the hospital systems close, it's not just the hospitals that close, but all the Supporting satellites, the doctor's clinics, the pharmacies, the place where you go and get, you know, your ACE Band-Aid. I mean, anything that has to do with how the hospital operates also closes. So basically, you're going to have a desert. And primarily, the folks who are going to be affected at this point are going to be communities of color. And it is really... Uh, it, it will really be an absolute health care crisis in Brooklyn, absolutely. And there, I don't know what plans are afoot. I mean, right now, the State Department of Health is looking very seriously at merging a Wyckoff Hospital and Interfaith Hospital, merging Brookdale Hospital with Kingsbrook Jewish. But if you're merging weak hospitals, you'll buy two years or three years. But what the long-term plan is to protect these hospitals, I don't know. Aside from merging, did you get any sense from city officials in your work as a reporter that anything else is, is being uh, considered to, to assist the crisis? Yes. So uh, folks at SUNY Downstate put together this study of why people use ERs. And what they found is people primarily use these ERs uh, when they don't have access to primary care facilities. So there is... Uh, a plan now being worked on to build up the primary care infrastructure in these neighborhoods at risk and to bring more money and more dollars from the federal government to create larger clinics so people can be diverted away from ERs and into these clinics that can serve more of their needs. So there are, there are discussions and people are hopeful that the federal government will be willing to supply money for this. The question is if the money will come soon enough. Is Brooklyn doing uh, worse than the other boroughs of, yeah. of the city? Yeah, sure, absolutely, yeah. Because of just because of the number, because of it has 2.5 million people and one in four is in poverty. I mean, it, it is Brooklyn is is doing much worse than the other boroughs. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we have to leave the discussion here. Ruth Ford, thank you for being in the studio with us today. Thank you so much. When we come back. Stylized haircuts turn heads and line pockets in one Brooklyn community. And finally from us tonight, in Bushwick, Brooklyn, barbershops have become a booming business among many Dominican entrepreneurs. Abby Shola spoke to two barbers who've turned the trade into a worthwhile career, and she filed this report.
My name is Edwin Velasquez. Um, they call me Ed Nice. I'm the owner from Brooklyn Finest Barbershop. I've been cutting hair over 15 years. I started cutting hair when I was like 16 years old. My name is Edwin Cobles. Uh, my nickname is Duri. And basically I'm a barber all my life. I started um, cutting hair in the basement. I started cutting my own hair. I used to have long hair. And I used to tell my friends from school to come. And that's how I started getting better. I consider this my career, different than my career. It helped maintain my family, my kids. Duty, he's real talented. He's always on schedule, he's always on point. He's one of my main barbers that I got with me working. Came in the United States in 1994. So basically I used to see people like kids buying ice cream that I didn't have. They're like, damn, I want to buy ice cream, but I don't got the money. And I don't like to ask people for money. So it's like, basically, I got lost, and I found a job in the supermarket. Then I started packing bags. Then at the end of the week, I used to make like $50, $60, $70. I used to help my mother a lot. People used to tell me, yo, why are you always on duty? Like, yo, you always on duty. Like, I didn't know that much English. So like, and they were like, what duty mean? My haircut is addicted. <laughs> if you think you're gonna come and get a haircut today and then you're gonna come in three weeks, no, you're gonna miss me. What I do, I do miracles. I used to cut all my brothers, my cousin hair in my house. I used to just put like one line, one line, another line, and I used to just play with it. These are my people, they, they're all barbers. I'm saying that, like I said, there's like five barbershops over here, but so love, the man can keep it up. All these barbershops started coming up, maybe like about six years ago. It was one of the first barbershops out here, you know, around that area. We've been here already over, a little bit over 10 years. Competition, there's no competition. Here, barber that don't know how to go here will not make it. So you gotta, gotta do this thing. That's one of, one of the barbers here, the classic one. You know what I'm saying? A lot of barbers that come over here with me like, yo, can you teach me how to do this, teach me how to do that? Why not? I mean, I'm not telling you like to be a barber, but if you're asking me a question, like, yo, help me, because they see how many clients I have. They see that I'm always busy. They see like, so they see, wow, this barbershop, this barbershop game is good. I can tell you, Bush is hard. You find a job here, but well, you're gonna get paid like $300. A week working from 10 in the morning, finish at seven, seven o'clock. Some barbers be like, they work, they happy with uh, $250 a week. Like, I, I, I don't make me happy that, you know? I'm not a barber to just work for money to buy Jordans, like, no. Nah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to retire. That's it, duty, always on duty. Brooklyn, Bushwick, Brooklyn Finest Barbershop. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.